Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. So my name is Ron Myers. I'm the director of editorial here at Jove. Um, so thank, thank you for attending our webinar today. Um, and today we have uh, Bashar Badran from the Medical University of South Carolina. Um, so Bashar, um, he published with us in 2019 on the advances of non-invasive vagus nerve stimulation. Um, so this, this was a paper that um, received a lot of attention with views, citations, et cetera. Um, so we wanted to invite um, um, Dr. Badran to come back and kind of talk about any recent advances to the technique or any um, modifications to the technique. So um, we will we will have a Q and A session afterwards, and we'll also send out an email after the webinar with a recording. So you'll have that for your records and you'll be able to ask us any additional questions you may have um, by email. And we can always connect you with one of the editors as well. Okay, so Bashar, I will leave it to you. Great, good morning, everybody. Um, Bashar Badran here, I'm the director of the NeuroX Lab and the Computational Brain Imaging Corps at the Medical University of South Carolina here in Charleston, South Carolina. Um, and first I wanna thank um, Jove and Ron really for inviting me. And Jove is an interesting journal that you can actually see the research, which I found uh, really important to take advantage of when we were first publishing a lot of this work um, that involved kind of a highly technical hands-on uh, brain stimulation technique that was pretty new um, and people wanted to see it. So I think that's kind of a, a really nice synergy that we were able to uh, take advantage of because uh, rather than just writing it, you can actually see it. So um, I think that helped um, kind of create a proliferation of this technique that we've been studying for about 10 years now. Um, and today my talk is about the advances um, in this technique, really non-invasive vagus nerve stimulation. I and mean, just to orient you folks, um, we're given about a 15 to 20 minute talk here. So it's gonna be fast. We're gonna go through good amount of material and I'm accessible by email if everybody, if anyone has any questions afterwards, we'll also have a short Q and A. Uh, these are my disclosures. I take some uh, machine donations um, from uh, TMS and auricular neurostimulation companies and have several pending or issued patents in the space um, and also own um, an equity stake in a tech startup that's developing meditation technology. And my lab here is called NeuroX Lab, uh, which is a multidisciplinary neuromodulation and engineering lab um, in the Department of Psychiatry. What that means is we have a bunch of really smart people that come together across several different disciplines to create new technology that doesn't exist. And then we test it in a variety of neuropsychiatric populations. And today we'll be talking about one of those technologies. Uh, for those of you that are not from the US, um, we're in Charleston, South Carolina, which is on the East Coast um, in a small uh, state kind of in the Southeast of the United States, a short flight from New York and DC um, and a long flight from San Francisco. And really the fundamentals of this talk revol revolve around the concept of the brain being an electrochemical organ. So neurons, um, which are the cells that comprise of the brain, um, can be activated by the binding of uh, various chemicals to receptors. And when those bindings occur, we have changes in um, calcium channels, which open, which cause depolarization and the release of more neurochemicals that then go on to propagate these action potentials. Um, but what you can do is deliver electricity to circumvent the uh, necessity of a uh, binding of ligands to receptors thus creating exogenous action potentials without any chemical intervention. And so really this broad scoping area of research is called neuromodulation because we can start to use energies like electricity or magnetism or sound to cause action potentials and perturb the central and peripheral nervous system uh, quite easily. Today we'll be focusing on the vagus nerve, which is cranial nerve number 10. Um, in Latin, uh, the word vagus uh, stands for wandering, um, and that's because it's the longest nerve in your body um, that spans from your brain and targets every organ in your abdomen and thorax, including your 
heart and lungs, your spleen, your liver, your kidney, your stomach, your pancreas. Uh, and what I like to say is that your eyes see, your ears hear, your nose smells, your tongue tastes, and everything else is vagus. And a lot of these um, behaviors are uh, operating in the background. So you don't even know that they're even active and these autonomic systems are always engaged. Um, and they work via cholinergic receptors that are at the end organs um, and the release of acetylcholine via the activation of the vagus nerve can modulate the relaxation or the parasympathetic effects of uh, the autonomic nervous system and cause slowing of heart rate, slowing of respiration and a generally relaxed autonomic state. I mean, I have a picture on the right here of the cross section of the vagus nerve under a microscope that's stained. And what you can see is the vagus nerve is actually a bundle of nerves. It's about 100,000 axons. And most of them are myelinated, although many of them are unmyelinated. And this bundle actually has several bundles within it that are surrounded by gristle. So this cross section demonstrate uh, the complexity uh, of the vagus nerve and how um, it can actually span across the body by having different projections go to different organs. Clinically, we actually can implant uh, electrodes uh, that surround the vagus nerve and deliver electricity to the vagus nerve. This is known as implanted vagus nerve stimulation or VNS for short. It involves this cuff electrode that's implanted on the left cervical bundle of the vagus nerve um, and a battery and computer implanted in your chest. Um, and this uh, pulse generator delivers a tonic electrical stimulation to the nerve um, in your neck for up to five years, pretty much until the battery dies. Um, and then you have to swap it out. Um, and this is advantageous because uh, early studies in canine models and then on in human uh, clinical trials uh, showed that this technique is beneficial to treat intractable epilepsy. So folks who were not responsive to medications um, and had epilepsy were able to see significant reductions in their median uh, seizure frequency um, and, and really change their lives by having an implant on um, throughout the, the course of their, their treatment. Um, over 100,000 folks have been implanted in the U.S. and recently there had been strides in getting other FDA indications aside from epilepsy, including chronic recurrent depression and gastric morbid obesity um, as uh, promising clinical uh, applications of BNS. But there are some cons, including um, its invasiveness, um, that the onset of action is on the scale of six months to a year. So if you came here and we implanted you, we wouldn't know if you're a responder to the treatment um, for up to about a year because these effects build over time. Um, and if you are a responder, you only have about a third chance that um, these are clinically meaningful effects. Um, and it's often quite co costly because uh, insurance coverage is limited. But uh, besides these promising clinical benefits, there's also a broad uh, positive uh, neuroprotective uh, and neurotrophic effects that occur in response to stimulating the vagus nerve, including increases in cerebral blood flow and neurotrophism, and transcription and reductions in systemic inflammation and glutamate excitotoxicity in the brain. Um, but none of these um, applications can really be truly explored because if we were to invest the time and resources to explore these in clinical populations, um, it would take hundreds of millions of dollars and decades uh, because of the implantation roadblocks. So it would be quite beneficial to start exploring the use of vagus nerve stimulation for a, a variety of different uh, clinical approaches uh, with a non-invasive alternative. Uh, and that's actually where we um, started this in actually 2013 with a variety of different um, syst systematic investigations looking at non-invasive vagus nerve stimulation as a potential alternative to the invasive implant. Um, and, and following up on those seminal works, we actually published in Jove in 2019, a video demonstrating our technique uh, where at the time, we used um, some now, what I would call outdated approaches. Uh, first, we would have a uh, electrode. And at the time we would use these 3D printed um, uh, copper electrodes that were also made out of plastic and were MRI compatible. Um, and they include a conductive paste and alcohol prep pad. So you would clean your ear and you would have a custom MATLAB script that you could still download uh, as part of the paper 
uh, and use with a constant current stimulator that would deliver electricity to specific parts of your ear. Now, for those of you that don't know what I'm talking about, uh, we're actually talking about non-invasive vagus nerve stimulation by stimulating the auricular branch of the vagus nerve, which innervates the left and right ears of humans bilaterally. So if you see here on the picture on the left, there's actually um, several different nerves that innervate the ear. And the green represents the auricular branch of the vagus nerve, which innervates the simba concha of the ear and the outer ear canal, including the posterior and anterior walls of the outer ear canal, landmarked by the tragus. And you can see the nomenclature for the anatomy of the ear here. Um, and I like to kind of focus folks on the simba and the simba concha region of the ear, the tragus, and the earlobe. Um, many of these targets are active targets because of the ABVN innervation. And the earlobe is uh, generally considered a minimal to no innervation uh, area of the ABVN, which is used as a control. Um, and this was what we published in our video uh, with these clip electrodes. And this technique is called transcutaneous auricular vagus nerve stimulation. There are three key parameter considerations that I like to uh, keep everybody aware of. Um, and we discussed this in the manuscript. Um, and these three parameter considerations are the electrical parameters, the ear targets, and the stimulation intensity. And none of these are uh, quite uh, locked uh, yet across the entire academic community looking at these uh, different approaches. Although we have a early sense of what seems to give a positive signal. And then pulse width, um, it actually uh, relates to when there is a positive or negative inflection of the uh, electrical signal, it's the width of that kind of rising edge to, lead, uh, to the lower edge uh, part of the waveform. So what we have here is a pulse width um, that has a specific set time. And what we use is a time between 250 microseconds and 500 microseconds, which seems to be the most electrically efficient pulse width um, to uh, activate uh, nerves in the body. Now you can use pulse square waves or pulse sin sinusoidal waves, but the peak to peak um, distance um, repeated over time uh, can be known as the frequency. So one pulse per second. So if you had one peak to another peak over one second, that would be one Hertz. Or if you had 25 of these in one second, it would be 25 Hertz. And what we like to use is a range between one Hertz and 25 Hertz. Although we've explored frequencies as high as 100 Hertz and burst frequencies. Now, ear targets are important as well because we have biologically active areas um, in the simba concha uh, and the exterior wall of the outer ear canal, but we also have non-biologically active targets that give a different afferent effect um, landmarked by the earlobe. Now, the last thing to consider is the stimulation intensity or how much electrical current you're delivering, not just the timing and the waveform, but how intense is it? Um, and really we like to use thresholds, um, in fact, perceptual thresholds or detection thresholds as the uh, control. So what we do is deliver high and low levels of intensity in a parametric estimation via sequential testing method um, to settle on the amount of current that you need to uh, detect the electrical stimulation just barely. Um, and that we call your perceptual threshold. And from there, you can actually dose um, on an individual by individual basis based on threshold. So you can either, either deliver sub threshold intensities. So between 50 and 90% of your perceptual threshold at threshold, which is 100% of your uh, perceptual threshold or super threshold, which is the predominantly uh, most commonly used parameter, which is two times perceptual threshold. So if you require about one milliamp to detect electricity at your ear, we clinically use two milliamps of stimulation. Um, and that has been determined to be not painful. And on a one to 10 level rates about a two out of 10, where 10 is the most intense pain you can ever feel. So it's relatively painless. Now, I wanted to focus on a couple of recent advances here um, because that's the point of why everyone's here. And I wanted to focus really on three things. The first is advances in targeting. And we actually can start to use computer modeling to optimize the 
the target placement of electrodes. And I'll show you some slides on, on what that means in a second. Then I wanted to quickly highlight some advancements in the wearable electronics and the electrodes that we've been using. Some of them made here in house, some of them made by companies that are now commercially available. Um, and then lastly, I wanted to follow up on promising clinical trials um, and highlight a couple that we did here in the last couple of years um, that show some clinical utility of this approach. Now here you can see the segmentation of um, a high resolution 3D MRI of the ear and the brain in a healthy individual. And what you can do is start to use these high resolution 3D MRIs to create segmentations of various tissue types. So here we start with the skin, move on to fat and cartilage and, and muscle, and then down to the skull and the CSF and all the way down to the brain. And you may be wondering why we do these segmentations, not only because it's interesting, but all of these tissues have various resistivities which impact the electrical current flow through the body. So electricity will want to flow more easily through skin and water uh, rather than bone. And so we actually use individual resistivities here to start to understand where and how electricity flows through the skin and through the body. Then you can start to map ear regions of interest here. Um, and these ear regions are related to biologically and non-biologically active targets that we were discussing, including the tragus and the simbaconcha region uh, and the earlobe. This work's done by Marum Bixen and Erica Kreisberg up at City College, New York, and it's quite an interesting uh, advancement. Now, after you do the segmentation, you can start to place electrodes on various parts of the ear to start to look at where the electricity would flow um, without having to do this in humans. So you can see we can pick several different montages, and I encourage you all to go look at this paper because it, this is the short version. Um, but you can start to place electrodes on different ear targets um, that you think might be beneficial. And I like to focus on montage six, which is the one we generally use um, in clinical trials that are ongoing. We have about six different ongoing clinical trials right now. All of them are using this approach. And when you place those electrodes on the computer model, you can start to inject current into the computer model um, and look at the maximal E fields generated um, in the ear and start to understand where the electricity is flowing through the skin and through the ear and where you might maximally target the ABVN. And so the Montage 6 is what I would like to call a, a more shotgun approach where we can have broad E-field propagation in the ear. Um, and we're intentionally taking a less focal approach, primarily due to the heterogeneity of the innervation of the ABVN. So some people may have a lot of innervation, some people may have a little, and targeting closer to the outer ear canal uh, ensures that we uh, primarily uh, target most of the ABVN in most people. Now, electrodes uh, have kind of made some big leaps in the past several years, including some PET plastic and, and you know, silver, silver chloride screen printed electrodes. These are made by a company in Dallas called Spark Biomedical. Uh, and these work quite interestingly as they stimulate two different targets at two different frequencies, targeting two different nerves with a return on the mastoid. Um, and these are skin-like electrodes that I found to be quite interesting um, and work quite well. Um, in our lab, we have been working on these flex electrodes that can be targeted on different anatomical landmarks, um, independent of a fixed form factor. And we've been using this both in our work in newborns, but also all the way up to more mobile applications where in individuals are moving around like post-stroke motor rehabilitation. They're lightweight, they're easy to apply, they take minimal training, they're flexible and they're disposable. The only limitation is they have high cost due to the lack of reusability. And lastly, I wanna focus on uh, several clinical trials that are quite interesting um, that were published in the last several years. Uh, one is actually using a new approach that we've been developing here um, in my lab um, in collaboration with Dorothea Jenkins, who's a pediatric neonatologist here at MUSC. And um, what we do is deliver electrical stimulation to the ear, and you can't actually see it on this newborn, but behind this um, individual's uh, glove is electrodes that are targeting his ear. And this baby is uh, receiving electrical stimulation at the same time as 
um, oromotor training. And this baby actually has deficits in oromotor function and can't actually uh, take uh, nutrition orally and is fed through the NG tube pictured here. Um, these babies are often stuck in the hospital for two months or longer uh, because they don't have the ability to suck, swallow, breathe. And that's because they were born either premature or with a global hypoxic brain injury. And so you can see what we do is start to deliver electricity uh, in combination with the feeding to start to rapidly accelerate the motor learning of that behavior. So you can start to take advantage of the neuroplastic effects of vagus nerve stimulation by pairing electricity with bottle feeding, um, which rapidly accelerates motor learning and actually gets these uh, newborns home in two weeks uh, without uh, gastric uh, surgery. So this was quite interesting and has received FDA breakthrough designation. It's currently in a phase one clinical trial um, and will be going into a phase two trial soon. Now, uh, sticking on the theme of pairing electricity with behavior to accelerate motor learning, I wanted to briefly talk about MAVENS or motor activated auricular VNS, another uh, technique that we've been developing here in my lab which involves auricular vagus nerve stimulation. So you can see this individual is receiving um, electrical stimulation. And then actually underneath his shirt are EMG sensors that can detect movement. Now, this individual had a stroke and his stroke affected motor function in his left arm. And the standard of care is uh, post-stroke motor rehabilitation in the outpatient setting delivered by a therapist. So this is Kelly Reich. Uh, one of our amazing occupational therapists here. And she's delivering task-specific training, uh, which are re directed repetitive movements um, that are used to restore motor function. Now, if you pair electricity with the repeated movements um, in this MAVENS approach, which is closed loop, uh, meaning the sensors actually detect when he moves and deliver stimulation at the same time, you can rapidly accelerate the benefits of task-specific training in the outpatient setting. And we've seen double um, the motor benefit compared to a non-stimulation approach. So this is quite an exciting area of research. Now, here is some videos okay, go ahead and left arm. of two individuals getting mavens in the closed loop setting. Okay, right arm. You can see that when she moves Relax. her arm, stimulation turns on, okay, indicated so by the second. yellow light. And if she moves okay, her non-affected arm, there is no off-target stimulation. Right Only when she moves her right arm is there a stimulation? And you can also do this standing in a mobile setting. This individual is receiving mavens while practicing uh, his putting technique. Um, we have two more to highlight. One is uh, moving auricular stimulation from the lab to the home in a remote monitored setting. And we actually started to pioneer this during COVID, which um, was a uh, difficult time for everybody across the country, but some individuals had uh, persisting uh, neurologic effects that were considered long COVID symptoms. We we're actually sending devices to individuals' homes, monitoring their physiology in a remote setting, and taught them to self-administer auricular stimulation to the ear. These devices were made by Soterix Medical for us custom um, and were quite interesting as they improved the patient's uh, fatigue symptoms. And lastly, we have uh, a large NIH-funded award that recently started between both the Medical University of South Carolina and the University of Texas Medical Branch with four PIs that range in experience uh, from neurostimulation or imaging, chronic pain, and medical device development to start to use these stimulation techniques um, to potentially manage chronic pain and reduce the burden that society has on using opioids. So we like to uh, think that we can perhaps replace opioids, uh, at least in a small part, with electricity. And with that, I want to say uh, thank you all for your time and for coming um, to this uh, great talk. And this is my team here on the right. You can see we're MD physicians and engineers and, and students and trainees. And I like to say that big ideas take big teams. And, and I think we have a really wonderful he team here at the Medical University of South Carolina. And I also want to thank my uh, current funding sources. And I'll take some questions. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Bashar. Great presentation. Um, so as you said, if, if anyone has any questions, please add those to the Q&A.
uh, uh, there's a question here in the Q and A from Tom Hildebrandt um, asking about left versus right ear stimulation. That's a good question, and um, we actually have been looking at that. There's a paper currently under review looking at the neuroimaging um, of stimulation concurrently with fMRI. We actually do a lot of that here and have published several papers on that technique, um, which I didn't highlight in this talk. We can give a whole talk about concurrent simulation fMRI. But what we're doing is that uh, we're looking at left versus right versus bilateral stimulation. In healthy individuals, it seems that the afferent propagation of the signal is independent of ear laterality. But if you have a brain injury, say you had a stroke and you have a lesion on one side of the brain, it's better to deliver stimulation ipsilesionally. So the electrode should be placed on the same side as the lesion or contralateral to your affected limb. Now, in terms of safety, is left more safe than right? Some people think that, and I think that's a uh, artifact of you know, uh, anecdote that's been passed down over years. In our stroke population, we actually deliver bilateral stimulation. It's been very safe and we've had no adverse events. Um, any concern about variability of AVB supply from uh, Proloi? Yeah, a lot of concern <clears throat> because we really can't image it and we don't know exactly where the nerves are in the ear. In fact, you know, I always talk about when I had a barotrauma and had a surgery in my ear um, and how my, I was very sensitive to a vasovagal um, effect because I had a very dense projections of nerves in my ear, but some others don't. And, and really it comes down to optimizing your electrode positioning to have kind of the most broad impact. Um, and that's the best we could do now until we can image and understand the underlying nerve anatomy better. Uh, Naveed uh, Kudapra says, how do you see non-invasive and invasive VNS working together or not in the future? I see it as a two-step process. Uh, first is you can wear um, a non-invasive ear electrode and, and kind of test the effects. The, and then perhaps if it works really well for you, you can consider getting an implant. But uh, that said, uh, if it works well for you and you don't need to have a surgery, perhaps you can kind of persist on it on a wearable ear electrode without a surgery at all. I see them kind of living as two separate camps uh, independently at first. Um, and then eventually, I think that the proliferation of VNS will only be possible via the non-invasive methods. So, you know, depending on whether you're a, you need this as an acute treatment, say for opioid withdrawal, or if you're, you need it for a chronic treatment, say for depression, um, it will impact your decision there. Uh, Eric Liebler, what about CTVNS? The modality has more indications than a uh, oh, sorry, then implanted, I believe. Any comparisons between TAVNS and TCVNS? Ah, that's uh, referring to um, a device that stimulates on the neck using a handheld wearable device that delivers electricity directly to the cervical bundle of the vagus nerve, which has some recent FDA approvals and has um, some strong company support. I think the device is called GammaCore. Um, I don't uh, particularly know too much about that approach. Um, we don't do a lot of that here, um, although I do know that it's being prescribed to individuals. Um, and so, yeah, I, I know what I know and I know what I don't know. Uh, Rachel Drew, for an investigator who would like to start to use this approach from scratch, how would you advise to go about it? I would advise you watch our Jove manuscript um, and then perhaps consider attending a training session. We have several different training sessions here at MUSC um, and actually kind of getting your feet wet by buying a constant current electrical nerve stimulation system from one of the many different commercially available uh, manufacturers and um, following their instructions. How do you prevent cardiovascular side effects? That's a good question. I think that the question of safety is really important and we monitor for that all the time. In fact, when you turn stimulation on, you see a reduction um, in heart rate between four to six BPM um, for an individual, depending on your uh, baseline heart rate. Now in newborns who have higher resting heart rates between 160 and 180 BPM, 
we see a pretty large drop in heart rate. Now, every time we see a reduction in heart rate due to the connection between the vagus and uh, cardiac fiber via cholinergic projections, uh, it never becomes a bradycardiac event. So it never drops below a specific homeostatic baseline. Um, and so we haven't seen that, but we used to monitor it a lot. And now that we've done several hundred patients in a variety of different populations, uh, we don't monitor it as strictly as, as before because we haven't seen even one um, adverse event related to cardiac effects. Another question is from uh, Xiang Su. Thanks for the presentation. I'd like to ask, could you please explain a bit more about intensity calibration? How do you control the same intensity between active and sham? So what we do is we place the electrodes on the ear at either the active site or the sham site. Um, and we start at two milliamps and we deliver a, a five second train at your fixed uh, frequency, say 25 Hertz. We ask them if they feel it, yes or no. And if they do feel it, we cut that in half. Um, so we go from two to one, we do the same process. And um, whether they say yes or no impacts whether we go up or down. And we do this stepwise testing until we settle on um, a intensity that is just barely uh, perceivable. You would do the same for sham, and then you would dose accordingly. Uh, Dave Arbach, similar to a small amount of sympathetic fibers in the vagus, do you see any of this when stimulating different areas of the ear? Uh, we haven't done head-to-head -head testing of different um, ear targets, although we're currently doing that now, testing tragus versus the symbaconcha versus a combination versus sham. Um, and so time will tell on that one. Um, the studies just began now. Um, I want to know about how this would help in autoimmune conditions like RA or lupus. There's several different groups, um, many of them um, at the Feinstein Institute that are looking at um, inflammatory effects of VNS. And, and many of them are in implants and some of them are using interesting vibrotactile stimulations. Um, I'm not 100% uh, up to date on the inflammatory uh, data, but it does exist. And I would encourage you to um, look it up on PubMed. Ajunta says, what is the molecular mechanism of improvement of motor neuron of chronic pain by vagal nerve activation? Um, we, we are still kind of trying to understand how or what the mechanism is of auricular neurostimulation. The current study hypothesis is that it is mediated via the release of um, endogenous opioids or endorphins. So we're actually running a clinical trial testing whether that's the true mechanism by blocking opioid receptors using naloxone. Um, so again, time will tell on that one. That study just started this week. Uh, Alessandra asks, regarding the project on newborns, could you explain more about the device that has been used for the research? Uh, the device is a custom device called Baby Strong. Um, we actually invented it here uh, several years ago, um, and it's a custom electrical nerve stimulator that delivers um, electricity to the ear at the same time as bottle feeding. Um, you can look it up. Xing Yong Su. Could you explain a bit about the fixation of electrode to make sure good attachment? Another good question. So uh, we used to use spring electrodes that had clamps. We now use adhesive electrodes. Almost all the devices, um, in fact, all of them, not almost all, all of them have a real-time impedance detector, uh, which is uh, good practice to have during constant current stimulation so that you can fix your current. And if the resistance or impedance at the skin level is too high, it won't stimulate. So that's how you, you figure that one out. Sabine asks, uh, physical fatigue is one of the transdiagnostic symptoms among autoimmune condition. Yes, you know, vagus nerve stimulation can treat um, heterogene heterogeneous a variety of different um, clinical symptoms that are uh, related to a variety of different uh, pathologies. So we do do several kind of broad investigations on symptoms um, independent of specific pathology. Um, Lillian says, thanks for your explanation. I'm very impressed about the motor effects of TAVNS 
what's the magnitude of the effects the patient needs to have previous movement. So there is a paper currently under review of the clinical trial that demonstrates closed that uh, four weeks of closed loop uh, Maven's therapy improves the Fugelmeyer uh, motor function task by five points compared to a unpaired non-closed loop approach only improves it about 2.8 points um, and a historical sham control improves it at around two points. So uh, this is only three times a week for four weeks. Now, the uh, company actually recently got FDA approval for the invasive approach, similar concept where you implant electrodes and deliver electricity at the same time as movement where the therapist initiates stimulation. Um, and those effects are the same. So they improve the Fugelmeyer by about five points um, in six weeks. So 18, to 18 total sessions compared to our 12 sessions. So I like to think we get there faster, but we have a significantly smaller sample size. So we'll be moving on to larger clinical trials soon. And yes, it's super exciting and, and everyone's really uh, excited about it. How long does it take for simulation to have an immediate effect? That's a complex question that I don't think um, I can answer it quite clearly, but I can try. There seems to be about a 30 second uh, onset effect in heart rate. So if we stimulate for 30 seconds, we can maximize the reduction of heart rate. So I know that you have to stimulate at least for 30 seconds. Now, anything longer than that, it's unclear if it's uh, inefficient or if we need to stimulate for longer. So we're working on understood understanding whether you need to be stimulating for a short bursts over a long time or long continuous trains over shorter amounts of time. Uh, we've been doing some parametric uh, studies here where we deliver increments of five minutes of stimulation active on up to 75 minutes um, and randomizing whether you receive all active or some blocks active in sham and trying to do a dose finding there. So uh, more on that to come. General question, what is the role of the microbiome and nutrition in vagus nerve stimulation? Um, I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure how vagus nerve stimulation affects the uh, microbiome, but it is an interesting question. Uh, Tommy asks, uh, especially in the modeling technique, uh, thanks for your presentation. I'm interested in this part. How do you think the integration of auricular therapy or acupuncture? Uh, what is your expectation in the future 30 years? 30 years is a long time. 30 years ago, um, uh, FD, the most prolific brain stimulation technique, uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation, wasn't even a thing. So um, I'm not sure if auricular stimulation will be used 30 years from now or if something new will come and replace it. Um, I like to think that it'll be here for 30 years and longer. Um, and that's because although a lot of the auricular VNS work is relatively new in the last decade or two decades, um, auricular therapy via auricular acupuncture has been around for 90 years um, and is still around and is still used on the battlefield. Um, and used uh, in clinics all over the United States and the world. So I do think there is significant overlap. I think that there's a lot of uh, smarter folks than me that have been doing this for a lot longer um, that can um, that get really excited about us just continuing um, in their footsteps. So, you know, I'm, I'm grateful to just be in this space and, and explore this further. Uh, thanks for a great talk. What do you expect the price to be for a wearable device in the near future? Um, I don't sell any devices, so I'm not sure, although I can tell you that they uh, can be found online for uh, between hundreds of dollars and thousands of dollars, um, and different manufacturers have different pros and cons. Uh, we're not married to one manufacturer and oftentimes build our own equipment using off-the-shelf components or FDA-cleared um, constant nerve stimulators like that are made by Digitimer. So, we have a lot of custom approaches, but we also work with companies and everybody has um, their different approach and different cost. Um, I don't know how much more time we have, but uh, Ron, how many more questions um, did you want me to go through? Yeah, you've had quite a lot of them. Let's, let's just do two more questions and then we can wrap things up, I think. Okay, two stuff. Let me go see if I could find the best two. Let okay. me scroll.
And for, for other folks, I know there's a lot of questions. Um, we will send out an email afterwards so you know we can help address some questions um, that way. Oh, someone's doing sub threshold on cardiovascular and it's beneficial. That's cool. That's good to hear. Strong work. Um, okay, most reliable biomarker. So I'm biased here um, primarily because we built a system that delivers uh, VNS in the scanner um, and use it quite regularly. So I would say the uh, best way and best biomarker of activation is uh, neurophysiology. So functional MRI in response to stimulation. And we're currently running the largest concurrent stimulation fMRI study uh, that's ever been done to date in 96 individuals uh, looking at the effects on the brain of ear stimulation. Now, if you don't have a fancy scanner or a system, uh, which you may not have, um, then you can use uh, different biomarkers like pupillometry or cardiovascular output, things like heart rate variability. Um, and the last question is, let's see. What are the pros and cons of different waveforms of electrical pulses, sine, rectangle, sawtooth? So it's a good question. And the short answer is, I don't know. The longer answer is um, we use both sinusoidal waveforms and rectangular uh, waveforms and burst waveforms. Uh, we don't use sawtooth, although it would be interesting to try. Um, and sinusoidal and square wave forms seem to have similar effects, primarily because the skin seems to act like a filter. So it's never really a true square wave. It's kind of like a curved square wave. Um, and the early days we would do um, unidirectional pulses, so anode to cathode only, so up square waves rather than sinusoidal, which have a charge balance. Um, but now we're actually doing both um, and the effects seem to be similar. So I don't think waveform is the most important parameter. I think it's more important to think about it as frequency and um, stimulation intensity being the top two most important. And with that, um, I tried to answer as many of your questions as possible, as fast as possible to respect everyone's time. But if you have any questions, feel free to contact me. Um, and this recording will be online. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Thank you for having me. All right, thank you, uh, Bashar, a great presentation. And thank you to everyone who attended. Um, you know, a ton of great questions here. And um, like you said, we'll, we'll send out an email afterwards with a recording of the webinar for your records. And you can reply to that email if you have, uh, you know, any any questions for us, and we'll take it from there. All right. You can, if anyone wants to get a hold of us, our website is neuroxlab.com, and there's a contact form, and you can just shoot us an email from there. Thanks, Ron, and thanks to everyone at Jove. It's been uh, really fun to work with you guys and do the whole the whole thing. So appreciate it. Likewise, thank you. All right, and and enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. All right, Bye. Take care. Bye bye.